insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. That was a quick transition there. I hit the button too soon. <laughs> oh, gosh. How are we going to edit that in post? Uh, we're not going to edit it. It's fine. Uh, I make mistakes. Big deal. I was moving the the board around that has all the buttons on it, and I shouldn't do that while we're live, actually, I guess. Mm. Anyway, welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 137. The Great Debates, Controversial Topics. I am your host, Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and intelligent co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? Um, as long as I stop hitting the wrong buttons at the wrong time, I should be fine. Yeah. Um, so how was school this week? Anything exciting? Um. So far, it's been fine. I've had some moments where it's like, okay, don't really want to work with people. Um, there was a fight in lunch today, so I guess that's kind of interesting. That's exciting. Was it scheduled? Were people putting bets on it or anything? No, but everyone like took out their phones to record it, and like the entire <laughs> of lunch it was is. stopped. And that's sort of what you do this in this society today, right? Yeah, like even my friend who didn't have her phone out, like said she wanted to record it, and I just thought. Yeah, that's just what society wants to do today. They just want to find disaster, record it, and then publish it to become famous, blah, blah, blah. Everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame. Not everybody can have a podcast like you, you know? Yeah. People have to find their own way to get famous. Mm. So this week we're changing things up a little bit. We're going to get a little controversial, as a matter of fact. Mm. <laughs> so instead of focusing on a single topic, uh, like we usually do and dissecting it to help folks with, I wanted to get your perspective on some what are often considered controversial topics. Um, and really this kind of – it's a series of debate questions and we're not going to get through the whole list. We talked about that. So we have a couple different topics uh, of discussion, categories I should say, in each segment. And uh, we'll pick and choose and we'll see where the conversation goes. But a lot of these are things that I'd really like to get the perspective – of a teenager on. I mean, that's really what the original purpose of this podcast was. It was to sort of get your your pulse on things. So um, just a general word of caution to our audience. We will be discussing a few topics that might not be appropriate for younger audience members, uh, but we will endeavor to keep it as mature and age appropriate as we usually do. Ready to get into it? As right as I'll ever be. All right. Yeah, there are going to be some uncomfortable <laughs> questions here, I'm sure, but yeah. I'm sure we'll navigate our way through it. Mm -hmm. Before we do get into it, I would want to invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions of the podcast can be found as Insights into Things, and we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, tune in, pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite folks to write in, give us your feedback, reach out to us through social media. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, you can find us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we're at Instagram.com slash Insights Into Things, or you can find links to all those and much more on our official website at InsightsIntoThings.com. Are we ready? If we have to be. All right. I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> so the first set of questions that I have uh, centers around education. And I'm going to throw the first one out there that's probably going to be a very uncomfortable question for you. 
And that is, should sex education be ma a mandatory subject for middle school and high school students? Uh, okay. As much as I would like to not learn about that stuff, considering I don't really feel like learning about it because it just makes me physically uncomfortable, um, I guess it is important to know that and I guess learn of ways to be safe in that kind of stuff and learn, you know, stuff about that. So I understand the importance of it and while I wouldn't really like to learn about it, I guess it is important for people, for high school and middle school students to know, just so that, one, they can stay safe, and two, they just know about it. Well, and it's also important to keep in mind that it's not just about, you know, safe sex, contraception, birth control, stuff like that. It's also about personal hygiene, reproductive health, and uh, a lot of the physiological changes that kids are going through as well that they teach you about It's it's stuff that, I mean, in my opinion, it's stuff that the parents should be teaching the kids, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something where I think the schools are performing a useful service because there's a lot of kids who don't have parents that are probably as comfortable or open-minded as mommy and I having these discussions with you. Yeah. And, and kids that don't get this type of education about these very important subjects – it can wind up causing problems later on. So with that in mind, have you, what kind of education have they had on these topics with you in your school? Like for the stuff I've had now, I know that um, like in sixth grade, like they kind of show you around the time you're having puberty, they show you various puberty videos and, you know, they educate us on, what we're experiencing, hormones and just physical changes and stuff like that. And I know they have the seniors taking a sex ed course in my high school. Okay. And that, you know, that, that kind of makes sense that they're covering things along those lines at the time where it's age appropriate. Um, but they're difficult topics, you know. They're very, it's a very personal time uh, the kids go through when they're going through these changes and, and it's a very confusing time. And I think part of the resistance that kids have is that's really not the kind of audience that you want to be sharing that kind of information in. Is that, yeah. would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, pretty much. I know that most people feel very uncomfortable uh, having to watch those videos and learning about that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a more, appropriate or more comfortable environment to do that in. But again, that's where it comes down to the parents and, and not all parents have the time to do it. Not all parents are comfortable doing it. And some kids, I, I have to assume some kids wouldn't be comfortable getting that kind of information from their parents either. Mm -hmm. How did mommy and daddy handle that with you? Have we, have we done a, a decent job at that for you? I mean, I technically started asking about it due to the videos that they showed us in school, but when this stuff actually happened, you uh, definitely made sure to inform me about it, you know, specifically mommy, because, you know, she went through the same thing I did. Yeah, I'm, I mean, there are certain things that I can, I can research and talk about, but it, having firsthand knowledge of, of someone who has the experience, is, there's really no substitute for that. Yeah. And that's certainly the case here. So... Uh, let's talk about something a little less uncomfortable, and that is, should energy drinks and sugary snacks be banned from schools? And when I say banned from schools, I'm not talking about kids bringing them in. I'm talking about the schools selling those types of things and basically profiting on uh, unhealthy habits, introducing unhealthy habits to kids. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean... Giving unhealthy habits to kids is probably something that schools shouldn't be doing. But at the same time, I don't want, like, kids to, like... Like, it's okay to have, like, a snack every once in a while. And I guess promoting this might not always help that. So, um, I suppose I can understand 
um, both sides of the argument saying, like, they shouldn't do it because they shouldn't be profiting. Like you said, they shouldn't be profiting off of unhealthy habits for kids. And then I can see, like, well, the kids would really prefer to have snacks because their parents don't really pack them anything. And, like... If the schools didn't necessarily profit off of it, and it wasn't, like, in that kind of way, I wouldn't really be, like... I guess what I'm saying is just maybe sell healthier snacks. Because I'm not opposed to schools, like, selling kids food, just... Um, maybe it could be a way to promote healthier eating habits, like get food that's going to be healthy for kids, but that they'll still enjoy and want to get. And that makes perfect sense. One of the complaints I think I have at work, we have vending machines in our cafeteria at work, and we have one that's a snack machine and one that's a, a drink machine. Well, the drink machine doesn't even have water in it, so you can't get bottled water. So you have to drink a sugary type of drink or a diet drink if you get anything out of it. And the snack machine itself has literally no healthy snacks in it. And, you know, being diabetic, I have to be careful how much carb intake I have and how much sugar intake I have. And there's really not a lot of choices for me there. I don't know if kids in school are facing these same types of things, but are you, like when you consume something at school, are you concerned about the nutritional value of it? Or is that something that's completely out of consideration for you? I mean, like, I don't really get anything from the school, but I do know the school does have its vending machines and stuff at lunch that you can get. And, like, I can definitely understand that, like, a lot of this doesn't seem like the most healthy thing ever. And, like, I mean, the thing is, I know that everyone, like, complains about the lunches that the school makes, and a lot of the times, I'm guessing, like, they just want some actual food, so they get the snacks. Um, and I guess the thing is, I just think it would be better if, they, if like, there was something healthy that kids would actually like to eat. Okay. I, I think having that desire to have the food there is important. Otherwise, nobody's going to consume it. Uh, but I think it is important that it's something that's fairly healthy for the kids. Yeah. So the next category is we're going to kind of move on from the education side of things. <clears throat> the next category is personal decisions. And I think this first one, uh, being a young lady, is a very important one to someone like you. And that is, should birth control products be easily accessible to teens? So... I know that birth control is basically, like, it basically helps to stop, like, pe uh, women getting pregnant. Basically. Exactly, yes. And, to be fair, considering how some teens do make some bad decisions, I guess it would be good to make it accessible to them because, I mean, they could make a really... They could make, they can end up making a decision that would result in them getting pregnant. And if they had birth control, it would probably help prevent that. And it would help them to keep safe if they were going to live that risky lifestyle. So with that in mind, who, who should be responsible for providing that? Is that something like, you know, there's various forms of, of birth control. There's prescription birth control pills, there's prophylactics that you can buy over the counter. Is that something that should be made available in schools? Or is that something that you should be getting at a pharmacy? Is that something that a doctor should be prescribing? Where do, where should the source of, of that be? I definitely don't think schools should be giving it because, one, I don't think they should have the right to do that. And, two, I think it's just up to the teen and their doctor and the family because, like, certain birth controls might be harmful for others. And, you know, like, I would definitely think that it would be better if, like... Um, it was more of a personal thing rather than a school thing to do. So, like, your personal doctor, your parents, like, I definitely don't think it should be given out by the school. 
Is it something, assuming it's done by a medical professional, is that something where uh, the parents should be involved in that? Or is that something where a teenager should be able to, to make an appointment with their doctor and, and handle that type of transaction in the privacy of the doctor's office without her parents knowing? I mean, I guess it kind of depends on the instance. Like, I think in some capacity, maybe you might want to let your parents know. But if you do feel as though you need the privacy, then yes, get the privacy. But if you feel comfortable enough letting your parents know and, you know, at, and they're comfortable allowing you, then yeah, you can let them know. Um, but like... Ultimately, I do think it's the teen's decision since it's their body. Okay, fair enough. So going along that same mindset, the next question I have here is, <clears throat> you know, you've already pointed out the fact that some teens make bad decisions. And it's not just teens. Everyone makes bad decisions. Yeah. Um, but some teens make bad decisions and wind up in a situation where they may be expecting so should teen girls, uh, should it be legal for teen girls to terminate pregnancies? Honestly, I know this topic is very, is definitely one of the more controversial ones. and That's why I made this list. Yes. And to be fair, yeah, I think it should. Like if there are good ways to, if there are ways that will help them and do it in a manner where they won't get hurt, or the teen themselves won't get hurt and will still be okay afterwards, then, yeah, I'd say legalize it because they're a teen, and in a lot of instances, they're not exactly able to take care of a child. And the thing is, if you think about it in a slightly different perspective, the, te the kid could end up growing in a household where the teen isn't able to even take care of the kid and will end up having to give them up for adoption or just and that or the kid would just live in a neglective household or a household where they're not going to be able to get a proper life and are more than likely just going to be miserable and and while, yes, it's bad, it might be bad to get rid of the child when it didn't have a chance to live, in a lot of cases, you don't really, you gotta think of it in terms of how would it affect both the mother and the child. The mother more than likely will be under a lot of stress considering, yes, they're a teenager, and yes, they did this, and thus, they have to live with it, but, like, who, not everyone is made up, not every woman is made to be a mother. That's the best answer I can come up with. Basically, they might not be able to take care of a child for one reason or another, or they might not even want to have a child for one reason or another. And ha having that responsibility, not everyone can handle that, especially when they're a teen. And it's just... It would just be better for the teen if the child if they didn't have the child it'd be better they'd have a better life and would still be able to live a good life without having the child and they could probably and it would probably be better so that that non-existent ch that child wouldn't have to go through the hardships that would have to come with being a teen mother but it's ultimately up to the mother's decision. And and certainly having a child is a huge impact, huge change on one's life and a huge responsibility. Uh, and, and you're right. Teens probably aren't prepared for the responsibility that comes with it. They certainly aren't equipped to provide for the child. Uh, so no argument there. My, my follow-up question to that, as you mentioned, uh, the possibility of having to give the child up for adoption – and you mentioned that almost as a, as a detriment, as a downfall or, a, you know, an alternative, an, an undesirable alternative. Do you think that, that adoption is a viable option if there's an unwanted pregnancy involved? I mean, yeah. I never really meant that as a bad thing. It's just... 
It's just, yeah, if you can't raise a child, yes, putting them up for adoption might be a different alternative that you could take. It's just... A lot of people don't really want to have to resort to that, I know, and... Like... Like, I don't... If you want to get, if you decide to give your child up to adoption as opposed to terminating your pregnancy, that's fine. The child could probably still find a family and live a good life. So I guess that could also be an alternative if you want to go with that route. And, you know, it, it's not a, a black and white situation here either because there are certainly health considerations that are at play mm -hmm. where – you know, having a child can can pose a health risk both to the mother and the child when you go go to full term. Uh, so that's certainly a situation there where if there is a, a health risk to the mother, adoption might not be a viable option. Yeah. So, um, but you're right. It's a very personal choice and it's it's something that's a very difficult topic to kind of nail down what the right answer is because it's it's very situational. So good answers though. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and talk about public policies and another controversial category, politics. Mm. We'll be right back. For over seven years... The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we are debating some of the more controversial topics in society. And we're going to talk about public policies. So the first question I have here is one that's in the news constantly. Should there be a minimum wage? Now, right now, everyone's talking about the minimum wage being raised to $15 an hour. Should there even be a minimum wage that's enforced by the government on private uh, business owners? That's the question to you. Okay, so the so minimum wage is basically like the minimum amount um, a job can basically pay someone. That's correct. So, I mean, I guess in a way it shouldn't entirely be all determined by the government and it should also be the actual owner of a certain occupation that should allow like what their minimum wage should be but at the same time you don't want like a corrupt uh what a corrupt ceo of a company ripping off uh their work employees but I definitely don't think the government, in a way, should enforce um, their own minimum wage and that maybe it should also be more or less part of uh, a decision between either – between just the people who run the company. So there's – I guess it's kind of a more complex situation because a lot of states have minimum wages mm -hmm. and then the federal government has a minimum wage. And the federal government typically – their federal government's minimum wage is usually lower than the states. Mm -hmm. So there's a big push nationally now to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which 
a lot of states, like the federal minimum wage, I think was at seven thirty-five or something, and most states are seven dollars, eight dollars an hour, something like that. So, a raise to fifteen dollars an hour is a significant raise, mm-hmm. which would have an impact on the businesses that have to now pay that because they can't. They're not going to double the rates of of all the products and services that they provide because nobody will use their services at that point in time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the cost of living continues to go up. So $15 an hour in most areas of the country is still below what's considered the poverty line. So the poverty line being the absolute minimum you need in order to put a roof over your head, put food on the table and so forth. So if $15 an hour is below that, how, how much of an impact do you think $7 an hour would have on, on people that, are making that now and trying to make a living and support a family. Considering the fact that having an even higher minimum wage isn't entirely enough, it's probably even worse with only $7. Like, they might not be making enough to even get certain necessities. Like, they might not have enough to have a good shelter or get good food or have correct plumbing. Right. Right, and that's one of the big considerations that that companies face now is that you have employees who can't afford to work. Um, and in fact, during COVID, when they had a bonus on on the unemployment that was paid for by the government, it was cheaper for people to quit their jobs and collect unemployment than it was to continue working. They would make more money on unemployment in many cases. Mm. So. If the federal government mandates $15 an hour, what recourse or what do you think the companies that have to support that are going to do? What kind of impact is that going to have on them and ultimately on the consumers? They're probably going to be charging more. Right. And thus the cons- and thus, the amount people have to pay to get their products is going to increase and thus more than likely inflation is going to get higher. Right, and it's it's pretty bad right now. One of the other negative side effects is if I've got five employees that I'm paying $7 an hour to or $8 an hour to, and tomorrow the federal government passes a law that tells me I have to pay $15 an hour, well, I can't afford to keep those five employees anymore. So two or three of those people are probably going to lose their jobs. And the guys that are left over are going to have to work twice as hard or the services or products that I put out are going to have to diminish in quality in order to compensate for it. So typically the cost of, of the minimum wage is usually something that's increased gradually over time. So the effects of it on businesses and, and society are not that dramatic. Mm-hmm. But there's this major push now that is really a huge uh, jump that a lot of people are very worried about. Do you think that jump in the minimum wage is good? Or is that like that $15 an hour, is that something that we should work towards over a few years? Probably work towards over a few years because just having that jump is going to really impact the economy and more than likely going to do so in mostly negative ways. Yeah, and I, and I agree. And I think a lot of other people kind of feel that way too. So the next question that we have on public policies is, should there be exceptions to freedom of speech? I mean, I feel as though if you're not really intentionally trying to hurt anyone, I feel it's fine. But I guess in certain instances, yeah, you, it, it, like... Freedom of speech should, in a way, be restricted. Um, or just there are exceptions to it. Well, and there are restrictions now. You know, obviously, you can't stand up in a the example crowded, everyone always gives. Yeah, you can't stand up in a crowded movie theater and shout fire because you're a public menace. Yeah, it gets a little bit more confusing, a little bit more foggy. When you start talking about some political speech. Yeah. Right? So, for instance, um, you have one whole segment of the population 
who is convinced that the uh, the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. And they're going out there and making all kinds of allegations and statements and stuff like that without providing any proof of it. And people are, they're getting banned. A lot of people are getting banned on social media. Is that considered dangerous? Like, is that something that would be restricted, like shouting fire in a theater? I mean, especially if it leads to some kind of violence or outrage. Yeah, in a way. Okay, so let me ask you something else. So let's go back before the country technically was the country. And you had Britain that was oppressing, we'll say, the colonies. And you had colonists who were trying to express that discontent by the acts of vandalism, really, that it was, of the Boston Tea Party, where they, they were they were protesting the tax on tea and the monopoly that they were giving to a, a, a company, and they tossed a, a, a lot of value of tea into the harbor in Boston. Is that freedom of speech? Is that political speech? Is that something that would have should been should have been restricted under the Constitution? How would you have ruled on that one? Hmm. I kind of figured you were going to bring up something like this when we mentioned this. Um. I mean, I guess in certain instances, freedom of speech can definitely be subjective. Um, especially in, when you, when compared to a lot of cases, like throwing the tea away in the harbor was a way to get America to stop, uh, working for, well, to stop Britain from being corrupt. And it was an act of defiance since they had been basically taxed unfairly. Okay, so that should be allowed. Well, I mean, probably not now. Okay, so it's an exception, but it's an exception with a time limit on it. It's just like, I guess if it's in, mm, mm, yeah, this is definitely controversial. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. So sometimes it's not it's not as black and white as you think it is. Yeah. You know, another great example is Martin Luther King's March on Washington, where they had this large crowd of people that were peacefully demonstrating. Um, and, you know, Martin Luther King gives a speech up there and riles up the crowd. Well, thankfully, no violence happened there. But the same type of thing could have been attributed to Donald Trump on January 6th where Donald Trump held a rally because he felt he was unjustly uh, removed from office. He riles his people up, and they go and they storm the Capitol. Was the rally freedom of speech, and was that okay? Was the march on the Capitol okay? What part of that was, was freedom of speech, and what part of that broke the law and the freedom of speech needs to be curtailed? Because a lot of people that showed up at that march on the Capitol will tell you that they were just exercising their free speech and showing that they're, they're just c content for the government. And they would have been perfectly right in that interpretation of it. So where, where do we draw that line? Is there a fine line? Is there a place where we draw that line and say, yes, it is freedom of speech and you can do it and no, it's not. I guess it's, when it's kind of attacking the country in a way, like when it goes against the country, when violence breaks out, and when it's just unjustly not okay. So when you break the law. Basically. It stops being freedom of speech. I'll buy that. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Uh, so we've kind of danced around the subject of politics. Let's dive right into it this time and ask a couple of political questions here. One of these is, is one of my favorite questions, and I have very strong feelings on But we'll ask yeah. the other one first. I know. I know that one. 
should the U.S. government, and this is very timely because we're about to get involved, it looks like. So, should the U.S. government be involved in domestic issues of other countries? I mean, I could see us supporting other countries in their disputes. Okay. Um... So I would definitely say that trying to help out the help out other countries would be okay. Uh, All right, so I have a couple of quick scenarios here. Okay. So Tonga, you may have heard in the news, Tonga just had a major catastrophe. They had a, a volcanic eruption there, and they're having difficulty feeding their people and giving clean water and stuff like that. So there's this massive international effort to get food and supplies to them. Is that an okay way of, of getting involved in domestic issues of other countries? Yeah, trying to provide supplies for those that need it. Okay, I'll buy that. I won't argue with that. So on the other side of the world, you have Russia massing troops on the border with Ukraine, and it looks like it's a, they're about to invade. And you have the United States that are basically, you know, saber rattling and moving troops into Eastern Europe and positioning them in case there's an invasion. And they're supporting, they're only putting them in their allied countries. They haven't engaged in any conflict yet, but it's clear that we're coming to a head here and something's going to happen. Is that level of domestic involvement in other countries acceptable? Hmm. I mean, hmm. I guess the thing is that I get, I mean, it's important to, I guess, support the allies, but at the same, I mean, I would think it would be, I would think that we should more or less be preventing the war instead of preparing for it to happen. Like, yes, if we can't find any way to prevent the war, sure, prepare for it. But maybe look for a way of preventing the war first. Okay. So, so preventative actions. I'll buy that. One more scenario for you. Um, a country is taken over by their military. So it's a legally elected government that's overthrown by the military in a coup. And that legally elected government kind of had a mixed bag of, of results when it came to human rights. They abused some of the people, and, and the guy was a bit dictatorial. So a military comes in and takes over. Their own military takes over, kicks that guy out of power. Should the U.S., get involved there and support one or the other? Should it prevent the legally elected one from being kicked out? Should it support the, the army, the, the military that's coming in because they're going to be less tyrannical to their people? How should that sort of thing be handled? Well, I guess the thing is... Tough questions. Yeah. Huh. I mean, like... I don't really know if the U.S. should entirely be involved in that in any way. And that's where a lot of people fall down. That That's the side that they fall on is kind of an isolationist mentality of, you know, we shouldn't be involved. But then... They say, well, you shouldn't have been involved in Tongan. You shouldn't have been involved in the Ukraine. We shouldn't be involved in other people's domestic issues. You need to take care of yours at home. So that's sort of where that topic expands and gets a little bit more fine-grained. Ah. There's, it's tough to find the right answer to these. Yeah. So the last one in politics I wanted to talk about <clears throat> is should there be term limits for U.S. Senator. So, so just to set the scene here, the only office, uh, federal office that has term limits is the president. And he only wound up getting term limits after 
Franklin Roosevelt was elected to a fourth term, and Congress put term limits on the president. None of the congressmen, none of the senators, uh, members of the House of Representatives or anything, none of them have term limits. Should they have term limits? Should all politicians have term limits? Probably, yeah. That way you don't just have the same people over and over again. Well, what's bad about that? Um, I guess if you have a pretty corrupt person, that's pretty bad because you can constantly have them in office and unless, and like, if a lot of people support them, well, it's not really fair to the others. Okay, okay. I'll buy that. I also, you know, my take on it is the office of president of the United States, which is the highest elected office in this country, should be the standard. It should be it should be setting the rules. It shouldn't be the exception to the rules. Mm -hmm. And when that's the only one that's an exception to the rule, it's a bit hypocritical on the part of our Congress. Yeah. And it's kind of disappointing that you have people – and these politicians – they pat themselves on the back when they've been in the same office for 30 years, 40 years. They get accolades for that. And when the country was founded, it was never founded with the premise of career politicians. You know, the founding fathers, you know, the principle that they founded this country on was citizen, citizens running the country. You know, the average citizen coming in, doing their time, you know, doing what's right for the country and then moving on and going back to civilian life. And that's exactly the example that George Washington set. George Washington came in, did two terms as president, and then wanted to retire and go back to Virginia. And the politicians that we have nowadays are career politicians. The first thing a politician wants to do when they get in the office is get reelected. That's the first thing they're worried about. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you don't have politicians that are really out for the common good. Yeah. And, and that's unfortunate. Um, anyway, so we're going to uh, take a quick break here. We're going to come back and we have three new cat, three different categories. Uh, only which I think we're going to pull questions from two. Uh, and I'll decide which two when we come back from the break. So we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking some controversial debate topics. And there's two topics that people tend to avoid in places like work and, and fun areas and stuff like that because they don't want the conflict. We've talked about one of them already. And that was politics in our last segment. The last one is religion. And we're going to talk about that now. So one question, <clears throat> lead off question here. Has religion become outdated in our society? Um, I don't entirely think so. Like, I definitely think it's important to believe in things. And I definitely think that some people sometimes need a higher power to be a higher power or powers or whatever you believe in. I feel people might, some people might need that, and while well, yes, some of the concepts don't entirely seem the most logical in our somewhat logical society, sometimes- You mean the Earth isn't the center of the universe? <laughs> anyway. 
I still think it's important for some people to have those beliefs, um, and, like, and philosophies so that maybe they can live better lives or that they just have something to believe in. Okay. Are you a particularly religious individual yourself? I'd probably say not. I'm Jewish and I celebrate Jewish holidays, but neither me, right now, neither me nor mommy seem, well, I'm not really in, I've never really been to temple. Right. I've, I don't know any Hebrew really. So does religion have a significant impact on your life? Not entirely. Okay. Not really. But you kind of leave it out there that it could be something important for other people and it could have a meaningful part in their lives. Yeah. Okay. I'll buy that. My take on it is kind of related to the next question. And for this one, I want you to put your history hat on because we're going to we don't want to just think about society today. We want to think about historically how it has been with religion. Has religion done more harm than good to society over the centuries? Yeah, that's... Hmm. So I've been doing... So in history class, I've learned a lot about lots of religious conflicts. Um, the Crusades were religious conflicts conflicts um i know that there were plenty of times where there's been genocide due to religion um and while yes religion does bring out a lot of good in people and it has good philosophies in a lot of ways religion has really come in conflict like different religions have come in conflict with each other and it's led to really bad stuff. Yeah. I mean, you think of the Middle East, you know, it's been called the Holy Land. It's for the merging of three of the Western world's major religions. There has been constant conflict. There's been millions of people that have died on the soil of the Middle East from the Crusades on through into the conflicts recently with the Israeli and Palestinians. People are dying constantly in the name of religion. You've had entire nations, you know, Iran and Iraq went to war with each other. They were both uh, Muslim nations of different sects that went to war with each other on religious grounds. I mean, it's difficult for me to look at all of the negative things that have come from religion. And that's not even, that's literally just talking to major religions. Not, it's not even talking about the cults, the cult religions that we've seen, the Jim Joneses out there, the David Koresh's out there that brainwash people and take over their lives. Um, just the amount of suffering. Yes, granted, there, the churches out there do charitable work and they help people and, you know, they promote peace, but. There's so much suffering that goes along with religion. And even if you look fairly modern times, uh, and it's you don't even have to look at the violence, you can look at um, the controversy with the Catholic Church and the child molestations um, that have come out of that and the, the damage that's done. So for me, it's very difficult to look at this and, and think that religion has done more good than it has harm. Yeah. Because the harm that it's done has been horrific. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about the the um, Crusades when, when Christians marched into Jerusalem and took it in the first crusade, they slaughtered everyone in there. They slaughtered Muslim. They slaughtered Jews. They slaughtered Christians that were in the city. They slaughtered so many people. The, the, the one quote from one of the historians was that the, the roads, the streets of Jerusalem ran, red you know, with blood. red with blood. You know, it was, the blood was ankle deep. And that was all in the name of religion. It's hard to make up for that. It's hard to, to patch stuff like that up, you know? Yeah. So, 
that's that's kind of my two cents on it. And I think you and I are kind of in agreement there that the bad was really bad. Yeah. The the good's kind of just sort of, you know. There. Yeah, it's just sort of nipping away at it a little bit, but not enough. Yeah. All right. Um, the last two topics we have, I have relationships and I have medical. Which one do you want to do? We can chip away at relationships. All right. So that's a pretty safe one to end on. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. There you go. So should arguments in a relationship be avoided or encouraged? Honestly, if they're not inherently harmful, like you and I sometimes have short bickerings um, about completely random things. And... It's the fu- it's kind of funny. I took my uh, health benchmark today, and one of the questions was, "What is a positive impact from conflict?" And the answer, um, out of everything, was stronger relationships. And that made me think. Conflict can actually strengthen your relationships with people, and I definitely think that. I personally feel that relationships can give you a different perspective on various topics. And conflict with them can kind of bring that out. And while, yes, I definitely don't think that any kind of violent conflicts should be allowed in relationships, small debates, kind of like what we're having, or just arguments about... Small arguments about things can actually help to strengthen relationships. And while certain conflicts, yes, definitely should be avoided, I definitely think that having smaller arguments can give you a different perspective and even make you a better person. And I think I agree with you 100%. I think arguments allow you to explore different aspects of the relationship. They can be intellectually stimulating. They can help you explore the personality of the people that you're having that argument with. And as long as it doesn't fall into the realm of domestic violence or, you know, mental abuse or anything like that, having having arguments, I think, is a healthy thing that helps build relationships. Nobody wants to be with someone they agree with all the time. That's just boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. I'm, I'm with you there. I think we're on the same page. And the last question that we're going to leave you with here is, should men and women have different roles in a relationship? Honestly... I don't really think they need to. I think both can be proven to have both have been proven to have both roles. Women can be the caregivers but can also be the ones going out and getting the money. Men can also be caregivers while also going out and getting money. While yes, some of them while yes, one might be better at doing one part than the other. I definitely think that both can do both roles um, in a relationship and not just with um, a married relationship, just having a relationship in general, both can more than likely do both parts. And I definitely don't think that either, like, while yes, there are, like I said before, there are things that one might be better at than the other, but I think both can suffice both roles. I, I think, for the most part, I agree with you there. I think there are certainly there are areas that one gender excels at better than than another, but that doesn't necessarily preclude the lesser proficient gender from taking on those roles as well. There's a compromise, you know. You have to understand that that everyone has to be take on their role, has to do their part. And, you know, yeah, mommy's much better at balancing the budget and doing the bills and and the, the, the finely tuned nature associated with the organizational side of things. But that doesn't mean that I don't take part in that in, in some form as well when she lets me, you know, when I she tells me what I have to sign and I sign it, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to do my part. Um and I know that, you know, the tech support side of things fall to me. So it's like, you know, when I'm not here, mommy can still fix stuff. She's great at putting stuff together. You know that. Yeah. Um, much more patient with furniture than I am. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, 
both sides can do and should do. You know, you don't want you don't want one one person in the relationship feeling as though they're they're being burdened by having to do an unfair amount of maintenance on the the household or the relationship or whatever. So I agree. You know, I think I think men and women can have different roles. They can have the same roles. You know, to the society that we live in today is very different than it was in the 1950s. You know, I came from a, a family, you know, a very traditional nuclear family where the 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 mother was the the the, the homemaker, the father went to work, and you know, those two sides never mingled and and there was resentment. You know, from from both sides. You know, my father, I think, resented my mother because all of my brothers and I were so much closer to her because we were exposed to her all the time. And my mother resented the fact that my father had a lot more freedom than she had. You know, my father would come home from work and he was done at that point in time. He didn't have to take care of the kids. He didn't have to cook. He didn't have to clean. And, you know, my mother had a 24-hour job. You know, except for when she was sleeping. She was taking care of the house, and my father never really appreciated that. Nowadays, it's difficult to do that when you have dual-income families, and, you know, the one member of the family is, is maybe a, in a professional line of work, and it's very different today. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to adapt to it. So I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. So I think that's it. We're not going to come back with closing thoughts because I don't think it's kind of a – uh, need it for this. All right. uh, we did only get through really a fraction of the questions that I wanted to get through. Uh, so we're probably going to turn this into a two or three parter, I think, because I think this, this was actually very interesting and, and very educational and entertaining for me. Hopefully the audience feels the same way. Yeah. Uh, but before we do go, uh, I would once again invite folks to subscribe to the podcast Audio versions of this podcast can be found listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, Buzzsprout, etc., etc. I would also invite you to uh, reach out to us. Give us your feedback. Give us your show topic suggestions that you'd like us to tackle. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you have an Amazon Prime membership, uh, you do get a free Twitch Prime subscription. We would love it if you threw that our way. It helps us out. Uh, You can also find audio versions of this podcast on the web itself at podcast.insightsintoteens. Video versions of the podcast can be found at podcast.insights into things or you can get links to all those and more on our website at www.insightsintothings.com and you and don't forget to check out our other two podcasts insights into entertainment hosted by you and mommy and insights into tomorrow our monthly podcast hosted by you and my brother sam well done that's it another one in the books bye everyone bye